your analysis is so fascinating. And if you just contrast the way the family has, um, you know, I think Heather put it better than I'm going to be able to do it. But but they've they've seized the moment and they've told people to vote. They've told people to be peaceful. And these are the words that you report Donald Trump has used since the movement has really taken hold over the last 15 days. Shooting looters, calling people thugs, terrorists, his threat to unleash, quote, vicious dogs, use of, quote, ominous weapons, his vow to call in troops to, quote, dominate the streets. And you write that they all evoke Wallace's inflammatory language and that it was Nixon who recognized the power of the suburban vote. Just take us through what you wrote today, which is profound. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about 1968, of course, because that was the moment of such tumult in the streets after the assassination of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. There were anti-war protests, there were riots in Washington and elsewhere. And so people have been looking for a historical comparison and thinking about Nixon's 1968 campaign when he ran on law and order. But what people forget about Nixon was he was actually running in the middle. He was running in the middle between Hubert Humphrey on the left and George Wallace on mm -hmm. the right. He wrote off the Deep South. That was going to go for Wallace. And so he was balancing the law and order, tough on crime, tough on protesters message with uh, support for civil rights, with talk about unity. His, his slogan was actually bring us together. He marched at Martin Luther King's funeral. He was not going to be uh, going to the, to the extreme that George Wallace did, even if he was trying to compete with for some of the same voters with some you know, uh, you know, law and order messaging. And I think that that's the thing that we, we forget. George Wallace went hard right. He was very uh, violent in his rhetoric about the protesters in the streets. He said that he would run them over with his car if they got in front of him. Uh, and that's more akin to what we're seeing, I think, right now from the president, a, a president who wants the violent language and harsh rhetoric. And we just saw a few minutes ago uh, defending the Confederate generals who were uh, uh, the source of names of American bases, refusing to, to rename them, even though his own military had said they would be open to thinking about that. Peter, there's a great um, anecdote near the end of the piece about Nixon actually going and meeting with protesters um, at the monuments. I mean, you've got Donald Trump militarizing the monuments at the hour of protest. Just talk about that. Yeah, now Nixon, once he becomes president, he finds himself more and more frustrated by the protesters. He authorizes domestic spying against his domestic, his domestic uh, adversary. So he's not exactly a, 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 you know, a shrinking violet here. And he's, he's cursing and grousing at all times behind the scenes about people in the streets. But he also has this uh, desire to reach out, to try to understand. And so in the days after the Kent State shootings, he basically didn't sleep all night and at 430 in the morning, uh, you know, directs the Secret Service to take him to the Lincoln Memorial where he meets uh, anti-war protesters and he tries to connect with them in some way. He's awkward about it. It's not really his natural, uh, you know, state of, of, of being. But he says to them, you know, I know you think I'm an SOB, but I care about this, too. He's trying to connect with them in a way that we don't see President Trump trying to do. President Trump has said that the George Floyd case is horrific and that he was shocked and horrified by the video. But most of his rhetoric, most of his language is about thugs in the streets and law and order and get control and dominate. It, it, he, he has done very little to try to reach out to those who feel the great pain of what has happened in this country and try to address that in a way uh, that would uh, that would seem satisfying. And I'm sure, um, Steve Schmidt, that it lands like blows to everyone involved in, in the decades long work to hear that we have a president um, who sounds like George Wallace. Um, talk about Republicans having nothing to say and just the tape that'll live forever of them sort of, you know, stumbling past their microphones with their hands in their pockets. I call that walk the geriatric shuffle, watching all of these Republican senators shuffle by with their hands in their pockets, nothing to say about the administration's ordering violence against peaceful protesters, not a word to be said about legendary Marine Corps general and former Secretary of Defense saying that Donald Trump is a danger to the Constitution. And we see Donald Trump's embrace of the Confederacy yet again today, his hoisting the Confederate flag, the Confederate battle flag, really as his campaign manner, banner in, in, a, in a fundamental way. And so what we see with Trump is, is he's really historically, he's the second president of the Confederacy. This is exactly 
what the George Wallace presidency would have looked like. It would have been one of incitement and one of division. And one of the great tragedies for the Republican Party, which is founded in 1854, it was the party of the North and the West that has now become so deeply rooted in the old Confederacy in the South, where the symbols of the fallen South have now become the symbols of the Republican Party. That's historically tragic. And so I think that when you see Donald Trump's divisions and incitements, the American people are rejecting it. They're rejecting it all over the country. And you look demographically at how the country's changing. It's just a death knell for the Republican Party as they alienate literally everybody except white males over the age of 70, which are the hardcore, steadfast part of Trump's base as it continues to shrink under pressure from his incompetent performance and divisiveness in the country. And people are saying, we can't do this for four more years. Heather, I want your thoughts on all the politics. And let me just add in um, some of the uh, poll numbers that seem to reflect um, what I think Peter and, and Steve have both touched on, that, that this has moved in a way that's almost dealt Donald Trump and his Republican Party out of the conversation that 80 percent of Americans want to have. Uh, in the last two weeks, this is from reporting in The New York Times, American voter support for the Black Lives Matter movement increased almost as much as it had in the preceding two years. By a 28-point margin, research firm uh, Civics finds that a majority of Americans support the movement up from a 17-point margin before the most recent wave of protests. And I think if you go back all the way to 2015, was, which was in the wake of some horrific, um, tragic deaths of, of unarmed black men, uh, the, the jump is even more significant, I think upwards of 25 percent, Heather. This is a watershed moment in American racial history. And I want to make sure that for all of the sort of daily news, we, we step back and recognize that. Um, we don't get opportunities like this so often because America has not dealt with the original sin of how we were created by the stolen labor of Africans and the stolen land of indigenous peoples. We haven't had a truth and reconciliation process. We haven't, we've had actually most of my our history, we have tried to minimize it, to justify it, um, to create a wholly different narrative through lost cause narratives. We have a minority of school children understanding why we even fought the civil war. I mean, we really have not dealt with this. On Monday of last week, Representative Barbara Lee and a multiracial um, but all Democratic group of Congress people introduced a truth, racial healing and transformation resolution, saying that this country needs to have a commission like that that helps us get on the same page so we can finally begin to turn it. Now, what does that mean for the Republican Party? I think this pandemic of racial violence and racism within a pandemic that is so driven by forces of racism and the gutting of our public ability to come together and respond to the basic human needs um, has shown that the Republican Party just cannot be trusted to govern this country cannot be trusted to look out for, to care for, to show basic human decency towards most Americans. And that's why you see those phenomenal numbers for a sentiment that is really quite basic, which is that our lives matter. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.